Corridor 9, which connects Bulgaria to other European countries. As you left the bumpy roads behind and started driving over the smooth asphalt, he was telling me that the opening of these, quote, these cream-like roads, unquote, made Europe so close that now people get, can go to Greece or wherever they want easily. Quote, something undreamt of under communism, unquote. Upon reaching the border checkpoint, we immediately turned back. Our trip was not oriented towards the destination, but towards the road itself. In the meantime, as we were passing through the villages, Hassan was constantly showing me the signboards which displayed the population of each locality. He was teasing the large numbers. These are all inflated. If you go there, you cannot even find, uh, you cannot find even the half of it. People registered in these villages either live in Turkey or work in Europe. Hassan's fascination with the Makaza road stems from the contrast between the different mobility regimes of communist and post-communist Bulgaria, as well as a wish to surpass the distance from Europe in both physical and conceptual terms. Anthropologist Brian Larkin describes infrastructures as, quote, the build networks that facilitate the flow of goods, people, or ideas, unquote. Thus, functionally, they are meant to form the architectonic basis of various forms of circulations. However, in Larkin's conceptualization, construction of infrastructures cannot be understood solely on the basis of their technical functionist, functionings, such as connecting geographically distant places and producing new economies of temporality. In addition to this aspect, they have representational qualities. They are products of certain desires and fantasies about the future and its making in the present. Moreover, they serve for constructing subjectivities, desires and fantasies anew. In these terms, pan-European corridors with, with their symbolically loaded name, and more specifically the Makaza Road, which connects Bulgaria to Greece, a former communist land to a never communist land, are the icons and materializations of Bulgaria's EU membership and the post-communist Europeanization process. Yet Hassan's narrative also points out to something else about the post-communist mobilities in this region. On the one hand, and as I have already uh, stated, it includes fascination with this new regime of mobility engineered under the EU project and its liberatory claims based on a contrast with the communist past. However, the freedom of mobility discourse, as it appears in the EU project, is equally based on abstractions. For instance, it does not account for the dynamics and the specificities of the mobilities engendered with the expansion of pan-European corridors to this edge of Europe during the post-communist era. On the other hand, the way Hassan teased the signboards and the inflated displays of population points out to two peculiar types of mobility that emerge after communism, as he particularly mentioned those who settled in Turkey and others working in Europe. By the way, like Europe here in the popular use means the Western Europe, of course. Um, I argue that historicizing and contextualizing these eastwards and westwards mobilities and how they work together in determining the presence of Krijali is crucial to understanding the dynamics of region formation in this periphery of Europe as well as the workings of the European freedom of mobility ideal in the moments of its actualization. Kyrgyzstan constitutes a special case in the context of Bulgaria, as it is uh, the only province in the country with a major et uh, majority of ethnic Turks over the total population. By the way, I take terms like ethnic Turks, ethnic Bulgarians, etc., from like the field, as these are how people refer to themselves as a result of the penetration of the language used by the communist state uh, to larger publics and its continuation in the post-communist presence. <laughs> Indeed, as an area, the presence of which is determined through not only the communist but also a previous Ottoman past, Kyrgyz has a quite diverse composition in ethnic and religious terms. Besides the major, like, major Turkish population, it is home to ethnic Bulgarians, Pomaks, who are referred as Muslim Slavs, um, Roma, and a small number of Armenians. While religiously, most of the population is either Muslim or Christian Orthodox, both communities in the region have rather secular inclinations and the regular religious practice is not very common. For instance, the central city has only one mosque and only one church. This is in line with the fact that, unlike many other post-communist countries, a major religious revival did not take place in the post-communist Bulgaria. 
Historically, Kurjana experienced an industrial boom followed by massive deindustrialization in a short period of time, which left the region under severe social and economic pressures. Originally an agricultural area specializing in tobacco production, the region began to industrialize slightly before the transition to communism and in relation to Nazi Germany's military industrial need for lead resources. The road of mountains that surround the region are rich in zinc and lead reserves. Between 1939 and 1945, the area was inhabited by German specialists and experienced an important industrial infrastructural transformation which included road expansions, construction of power plants and housing for miners. Later in the communist era, exploitation of road ops mine reserves reached an extreme level uh, due to the operation of the Bulgarian Soviet mining enterprise Gorupso. While under the Nazi-Bulgarian alliance, there were only two operating mines, uh, which extra extracted, extracted 285,000 uh, tons of ore in the four years between 1941 and 1944, uh, Gorupso established 17 new mines, and the region's yearly lead yield reached some um, 3.5 million tons in 18, uh, 1989. The massive industrialization in, in, uh, in the Rodops caused the establishment of several mountain villages to ha house mine workers and their families. Further investments were provided for the opening of vocational schools, which trained the architects of socialism, and for the construction of roads between new villages and mining sites. These were also accompanied by the state-owned tobacco monopoly Bulgar Tabak's investments to industrialize the tobacco sector and the opening of textile factories, which mainly employed women. Consequently, Kurjali became an industrial hub, which received labor migrants not only from within Bulgaria, but also from other communist countries such as China and Vietnam. In other words, while Bulgaria was one of the poorest and most rural countries in the Eastern Europe prior to the communist era, Industrialization process that escalated under the communist rule provided the region with significant social and economic advantages. In line with this, all of my informants refer to the communist past as a period of exuberant community life, economic calmness and prosperity during which no one needed to worry about paying the rent or finding a job. For instance, while telling me about his experience as a high school student in communist Kirjali, Hassan remarked that even on the day he started the high school, um, it was determined for him which factory he would be working at once he finished the school. I even knew the number of the locker I was going to use, he added. I argue that it does not really matter if what Hassan says is exactly true or not. Rather, what matters is the fact that um, the way Hassan remembers the future of uh, the communist past commits a feeling of certainty and security which is lost in the post-communist period and replaced with the uncertainties and insecurities of the free market economy. While these narratives display a divergent trend in the way communism is remembered in comparison to the bitter narratives from other post-communist uh, countries in Central and Eastern Europe, the dark side of the story becomes apparent when people start talking about the assimilationist culture policies of the late communist era, which troubled the ethnic minorities of Bulgaria. The culture policies of the mid-1980s increased the state intervention on religious practices and forced people to change their non-Bulgarian sounding names while the major target was Muslim populations of Turkish, Pomak and Roma descent. As these policies were combined with political uncertainty due to the demise of the communist system, in 1989 some 350,000 people migrated to Turkey from not only Kurjali but also other Turkish populated regions such as Razgrad and Haskovo. Many of these people lost their Bulgarian citizenship and then regained it after Bulgaria's entry into the European Union. These eastwards mobilities and the constant circulations they created are currently at the tar target of Turkey's conservative Erdogan government and its neo ottomanist practices. Most of my informants were harshly critical towards uh, Turkish government's continuous attempts to politicize the Muslim communities of this region on the basis of uh, their religious identity, emphasizing that religious affiliations do not constitute a cleavage for peoples of Kurjali 
and that Bulgaria is a quite distinct case uh, compared to former Yugoslavia. In one of the villages I visited, various residents kept complaining about these interventionist policies, telling me that in the holy month of Ramadan, Turkey's Presidency of Religious Affairs went too far and sent an imam from Turkey, although the vill village already had one. The explanation for this inter intervention was that the current imam drinks alcohol and thus he cannot be a true Muslim. In these terms, religious interventions of the Turkish government on this Muslim majority region in Europe creates a mirror image of the cultural policies of the late communist Bulgarian government. While the latter tried to efface Islam from this geography by force, the former insists on imposing a peculiar way of Islamic life that is largely incommensurable with the practices of this region's Muslim communities. In the meantime, Bulgaria's transition into a free market economy after 1989, coupled with the massive decrease in global metal and tobacco prices, hit the local economy and initiated the deindustrialization of the region. Kurjali now is home to non-operating mine plants, um, and, uh, and uh, sorry, in addition to hollow factories and has an unemployment rate of over 20%. Widespread, widespread poverty and unemployment eventually recast its inhabitants as the cyclical workers of Western Europe as Bulgarian nationals became EU citizens in 2007. In other words, once the mining and tobacco reserve of the Eastern Bloc, Kujali is now a labor reserve for Western Europe. However, stories about natives of Kujali settling in the Western European countries are quite rare. Labor migrations are mostly cyclical. While people work for various jobs for months in the Western uh, Europe, at the end of these periods they settle back in Kujali until a new period of migration. In these terms, constant, constant arrivals and departures become a primary means of livelihood for this region, while this also marks even the nearest future of Kujali residents with uncertainties. As we were passing uh, time over some cups of coffee one afternoon, Hassan, who is at the same time a small-scale local business owner, began talking to a doctor from uh, one of Kujali's uh, villages. Call your brother, call your brother in law today. He has been working in Belgium, right? I have this new hostel and I need a receptionist. He can come to, uh, tomorrow and start. So, on the one hand, pan-European corridors enable the immediate circulations of goods, people, and the labor power by connecting geographically distant places. Uh, on the other hand, the same immediacy they provide also configures the uncertainties that significantly mark the uh, lives of Kurjali residents in this trans transnational free market economy. In her recent book on the governance of mo mobility, Hagar Kotev argues that in political theory that is often termed liberal, movement and freedom are often identified with each other. Movement, that is, is the material substance of a long-standing concept of freedom. Then these westward mobilities that disseminate from Kurjali and which are facilitated by the pan-European corridors as well as the EU passports, travel such easy equations between freedom and mobility, since in this constellation of escalating uncertainties, freedom of mobility and economic rigor are, are tightly knit to each other. Simply, there appears a condensed tension between freedom of mobility and condemnation to being mobile in the liberal European lives of Kurjali residents. Throughout my research, I also observed a considerable continuity between the types of education Kurjali's migrant laborers received in the vocational schools of the communist era and the jobs they find in Western Europe today. For instance, those who have been trained to become dairy producers tend to work in cheese factories in Germany and Netherlands. Others who have been trained to be skilled construction workers are now doing similar jobs all over Europe. In this conjuncture, together with the anthropologist Gerald Creed, I argue that we cannot think of post-communism as the social, economic and political condition of only the countries with a communist past. Considering that the vocational schools of communism train the skill subjects of today's Western European cap capitalist industries, I claim that post-communism is, is, is a rather more general condition of global politics and economies, uh, which inherently marks the dynamics of geographically distant spaces. Moreover, this case reveals the significance of a labor-focused labor approach in studying labor migrations. 
What I say may sound like stating the obvious, as labor migration is intrinsically about labor. However, I believe that in many accounts of labor migrations, the labor aspect is taken for granted and mobilities are mainly related to the scarce resources of employment in the migrants' home countries. I want to uh, state that this approach is inadequate in offering us a way to understand the difference that migrant labor makes in the context of the countries these people migrate. Following Bruno Latour's suggestion that an idea or practice cannot move from a, uh, a to B solely by the force that A gives it, B must seize it and move it, I argue for developing ways of accounting for the specificities of the jobs towards which the migrant labor is oriented and regarding their labor as the condition of possibility for the continuation of the Western European political economic systems. I believe that especially for the case that I try to discuss today, such a labor-focused approach could clarify the continuities between Eastern European communism and today's Western European capitalism, in addition to what is specifically post-communist about the type of migration that is at stake. Thank you.